All right, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started since it's uh, 1400 Eastern time. Um, so today's webinar is going to be on net zero scope emissions. Um, Brandon Martin is going to be giving us this presentation. Here are our links and references. Here's a little bit about, about Brandon. Brandon Martin is a mechanical engineer in the military engineering branch, FM and EC section at headquarters USACE. Brandon has served as Louisville, Louisville's district mechanical design chief for over 13 years and has extensive experience in mechanical engineering, commissioning, and sustainability, which has included all phases of planning, design, and construction. Brandon is a licensed professional engineer in, in Kentucky, certified energy manager, certified building commission, commissioning professional, and a lead accredited professional. So at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Brandon for the presentation. Hey, thanks, Ed. Um, and then, were you going to give me control or? Just allow, assign control. Okay, I think I made you presenter, so now you might have to share your um, oh. slide deck. It won't let me give my computer control over <clears throat> to you with this group. Oh, man, I can't show all your secrets out there. Um, <laughs> Check my email. Make, make a few. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can you guys see that screen? Okay. The yes. uh, cover page. Okay, great. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start with a quick joke. I use the same joke all the time, so some of you may have already heard this. Uh, but, but why is wind power so popular? Anybody can come off mute and tell me. All right. All right. Nobody. Either nobody's brave enough or no one knows So I can answer. go windsurfing. Windsurfing? All right. That's a good answer. It, it's because it has a lot of fans. Because of all the audience. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> yeah. So, I've only ever yeah. seen one. You've only seen one fan? Depends on where you live, I guess. Uh, all right, well, let me get going. Uh, so I do have a hard stop at three. So if, if there's any remaining questions going on at that point, I may have to stop just, just for awareness. Uh, we're going to talk about the federal and DOD emissions electrifications policies. Um, talk about, so they talk in terms of scope one, two, and three emissions. We'll talk about what those are. Um, at the time this was uh, drafted, uh, we only had the federal building performance standard. The DOD policy had not come out yet. I did add a, a, a little bit of information about the DOD policy, but uh, you'll see that some of the slides are uh, from the standpoint of um, a time before the DOD policy came out. But we'll talk about the building performance standard and, and a little bit about how that relates to the DOD uh, memo. Uh, we'll talk about um, you know, the, the energy optimization goals haven't gone away. That's still a requirement. Uh, some of the challenges associated with electrification and then some useful links uh, will be shown. So the requirements are coming from the executive order 14057 uh, from December of 2021. Uh, and that has a number of sustainability and energy requirements, including carbon free electricity, uh, net zero uh, emissions, uh, all electric fleets, um, and and uh, net zero federal procurement, all kinds of things in that uh, executive order. The one we're concentrating on is the net zero emissions goal for the entire agency portfolio by 2045. Um, an intermediate goal is to achieve a 50% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2032. So to help drive towards achieving that, the uh, executive office under the president developed this federal building performance standard uh, that was released uh, this past December. And um, the, the initial target or, or sort of incremental step is to achieve zero scope one emissions uh, from on-site fossil fuel use through building electrification for 30% of an agency's applicable fa facilities. And we'll get more into that in a moment. Uh, the DOD did issue a memorandum that was signed March 29th, I believe. Uh, and, and so the way the DOD is, is tackling that 
uh, requirement is to apply uh, this to all new construction uh, that's passed the, um, that's hasn't achieved 15% design completion yet. Uh, and then if we're between 15 and 35% design completion, so we're between code two and code, um, I'm sorry, we're between PDR and code uh, two completion, 35% design, then we design to incorporate future electri electrification, which would include conduit chases, panels. And we're working on a little bit of uh, trying to figure out the, where the limits of that are. But uh, existing buildings, we use all electric uh, when the system is at the end of its expected uh, useful life. Uh, we have unexpected systems systems failures and any major renovations where those components are being replaced as part of uh, restoration and modernization. So in most cases, when there's some kind of renovation or rehabilitation of a of an existing building, those uh, systems would change to all electric. Uh, we also have district utility plants. So there's guidance in there about the utility plants. Um, we're, we're not to retrofit util those plants. If, if they use scope one emissions, we're not to retrofit those to extend their useful lives. So if it comes to, hey, we got to do some kind of major capital uh, improvement on a utility plant to keep it running, that's, that's not supposed to happen. Um, so, and then uh, we can continue to use those plants through the end of the useful life. We'll talk more about the buildings connected to those later. Here's a nice graphic that uh, shows uh, the different types of emissions. Scope one are emissions that are on site, owned, that are controlled by a federal agency. So if you think about a typical MILCON type project, it's, it's just the, um, the uh, infrastructure within the building. It'd be uh, space heating, water heating, laundry, uh, cooking, those kinds of things, um, generators, all of that. Uh, scope two emissions are what you would see at a power plant. Um, if, if you've got some kind of central energy plant that's off base, not federally owned, that, that would fit in that category. Um, so th those are things we don't directly control. And then scope three are sort of the ancillary, you know, the activities that generate emissions, but they're not um, directly generated by our operations. So, you know, our waste disposal and, and all the, the, the emissions that comes from that, those processes of, of handling the waste, uh, employees commuting back and forth to work, our business travel, um, all of those kinds of things. So, so just again, on the scope one emissions, these are direct greenhouse gas emissions for, uh, based on from fossil fuel using uh, equipment on our uh, on federal property, so our buildings, you know, and, and those would again be uh, uses such as space heating, you know, natural gas for space heating or water heating, uh, laundry, cooking, those kinds of things. If we have district energy plants and, and we're still using any kind of oil or coal, I'm not sure if we do, but um, if so, those count towards scope one if they're on federal land, uh, you know, so. Uh, Anything we control directly from the federal government side is scope one. So what are we supposed to do about scope two emissions? And, and, and this also goes hand in hand with the question, okay, so we're, we're going all electric on one side of this, on the building side. What about the installation side of this? Um, and what about the power grid side of this? So, um, it, you know, the, the, the goal is to, for the federal government to try to leverage its pur purchasing power uh, to green the grid and try to uh, transition the existing uh, electrical generation profile to, to more carbon-free electricity. Um, we would also use on-site or installation level carbon-free electricity, so renewable energy where we can. Uh, there may be a point where we're buying energy uh, certificates. Um, you wouldn't do that with Milcon, but that might be something the federal government's uh, looking at doing. Uh, but then, you know, the, the, um, the strategy we always have of low, increasing our energy efficiency, reducing our loads, and just, just really optimizing our building for energy. So the lower the energy use, the lower our scope two uh, emissions would be. Uh, th these are not things that we generally control in, in the core. Uh, they're being covered by other initiatives. So we're not going to talk about scope two emissions and what's happening on the other side of the, uh, the equation today. Scope three emissions actually got, uh, have this fleet thing in here wrong, but we do have a requirement to convert our um, 
fleet, our light duty vehicles have to be uh, zero emission by uh, 2027, and then the rest of our fleet by 2035. That's actually a scope one emission. Those are federal uh, vehicles. So I actually have that misclassified. Uh, Apologies. Uh, solid waste diversion uh, is is another thing. We already have a requirement for solid waste diversion, um, and and that's a contributor towards scope three emissions. Uh, you know, other things we're looking at is low carbon materials. There's several pilot projects. One was uh, some of those were discussed last week in the webinar. Uh, but looking at uh, reducing the, the carbon footprint of our materials in our construction projects, uh, reducing travel, uh, you know, continuing to encourage mass transit ride sharing. There's other things we could do. Ho you know, people with telework lately, there's been some talk about hoteling uh, spaces rather than having everybody have a, a workstation in a building uh, in order to reduce our footprint. And uh, that would further reduce our Scope one uh, and two emissions as well. So applicable facilities. So, so the, uh, the, this applies to all new facilities if they were constructed after October 1st, 2021. So yes, that's, that's a year's worth of buildings. We've finished construction and this applies to those uh, facilities also. Uh, the existing ESA covered facilities um, are also covered under this. So those are facilities that make up the top 75% of the agency's energy use. And those buildings are generally already identified. Uh, there's already been work done to identify which facilities, which list of facilities when taken aggregately make up the top 75% of an agency's energy use. So those buildings are uh, re required to comply with this or, or part of the um, building portfolio required to comply with this. So again, the requirement is to achieve net uh, zero scope one emissions for 30% of those applicable facilities. So uh, tr we, it's not 30% of a building square footage. We're not trying to make up 30% of the demand with, uh, you know, electrification. This is talking about 30% of an agency's um, uh, building portfolio uh, would need to uh, be electrified. But it's not the entire building portfolio. It's all new facilities after 2021, and it's only the ESA covered facilities. Um, and this, these targets can incrementally increase over time between uh, now and going forward until they meet the goal. So they will probably issue more stringent guidance as we go along. But just to think of it, the, the scale, or actually, let me just kind of, this is a site that you could go and look up the facilities if, uh, that, that uh, an agency has that are in that ESA covered uh, category, uh, but just to point out, it's not every it's not every facility we own uh, in the federal government. It's it's a certain subset of that that make up the the group of buildings that we have to um, achieve that thirty percent from. Um, <clears throat> hmm. All right. Next is, uh, oh, actually, I forgot. What I was going to get at is uh, a figure from uh, DOD about the number of buildings they have would be like, they have over 600,000 buildings. Just think about that. Let's say, uh, let's say that 10% uh, of those, and that's, that's way low. Let's say 10% of those were ESA covered facilities. So 10% of those make up 75% of the energy use, meaning those are high energy intensity or, or very large buildings, right? And just, just, and, and that's probably way too low a figure, but let's go with 10%. So 60,000 buildings, right? And let's say half of those need to be, I'm just making this up by the way, but let's just say half of those have to be, um, are already electric. So the other half would have to be uh, electrified, right? So that's still 30,000 buildings. And we've got uh, what, so this is 2023. We've got seven years to convert 30,000 buildings per that policy, which is a pretty tall order probably not going to happen and that's when you see the dod policy and the dod policy applies to all all renovations um, and new construction that's part of the strategy to do, make best possible speed towards this goal so if we look at facilities to retrofit uh, so existing facilities that we need to electrify we look at the same criteria we would just in general for a retrofit of a building are we going to continue to need the building going forward uh, is there high energy and water use at the facility such that the, the opportunities are better, that we get the biggest bang for the buck out of any investment we put in? 
Uh, does it have high O&M costs? So there's a lot of breakdowns, and so there would be a benefit of reduction in, in maintenance cost if we replace the equipment. Is it large square footage? Um, you know, there's a social justice piece to this that's, you know, are we in an underserved community? And do we need to put money into that? Uh, is that that may make it a higher priority for putting money into the uh, project? Uh, are we at the end of equipment useful life? So these are very similar to, to just any list of criteria you would use to decide whether you need to do a retrofit anyway. But this would be also uh, applicable to hey, now we need to electrify. So let's let's look for these opportunities. And then once you have electrified, that counts towards your compliance towards that thirty percent requirement. So. Exceptions. There are exceptions to uh, full electrification. We have laboratories and equipment testing uh, facilities that that require uh, the use of fossil fuels. So some examples given in the standard would be where we're testing jet engines or we're doing material processing. There could be at the bottom, it talks about process loads. There could be manufacturing, industrial, commercial processes that require the use of fossil fuels. Um, and so those would be uh, exceptions to this uh, policy. So, and, and this is why they continuously throughout the policies talk about space heating and water heating and laundry and cooking and non-emergency um, uh, generators, right? They're, they're pointing out that it's the typical uses within a facility, not, not the uh, process type uh, loads or special loads that have to use fossil fuels to, to meet the mission requirement. Um, you know, any of these are, are are at the discretion of the head of the agency, right? And so the DOD policy talks about some of these things also. There are a couple compliance pathways. One of them is uh, the net zero or the zero scope one emissions pathway, which means you, hey, you have zero emissions coming from the facility at the end. That applies to both new construction and retrofits. Uh, so for new construction, you would just not put in any uh, uh, gas fired equipment, for example. Uh, for those uses, you know, unless you have these exceptions here. Uh, so anyway, the, the other one is this prescriptive pathway. And, uh, you know, it looks like this. There's a whole list of these applications and the building performance standard talks about what kind of, um, you know, if you had water heating, for example, on the right there, gas hot water boiler for central domestic hot water, it'll talk about what the prescriptive measures would be to change those, which is pretty much just change to a heat pump water heater uh, and then considerations for uh, that you need to consider when when dealing with that. Um, I'm going to say not all of these are practical. I feel like they've left out a little bit of the uh, some, some applications where this could be an issue and that's OK. But, you, you know, it's just examples of things you can do to try to uh, electrify different uh, types of equipment. Uh, but they call that the prescriptive pathway. But in the end, if you comply with all of these, you've complied with the first pathway. So not sure why they broke that down. Anyway, uh, again, that table's there. So if you do need some ideas for how to electrify, then, then that table's out there in the, in the building performance standard. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've already talked about some of that. If you implement all of these, uh, I think they call it the prescriptive standard because there may be some equipment that's fossil fuel you use in the building after you're done. But but these specific ones, if you change them and follow the standard, they're going to say, and you do it for every every bit of the equipment that applies, then, then they're going to say the building complies in that case, even if you do have some fossil fuel usage in the building. So I believe that's why they call it the prescriptive pathway. Uh, and you'll you'll see a link to the, the standard and you can read that at your uh leisure uh so the implementation of this we do have a dod memorandum at this point the army guidance hasn't been issued yet uh an ecb should be issued soon and ed, ed can speak to that um but recommended action that i that i would have is you're probably already getting questions about this on your pd from your project delivery teams or wondering what to do about this uh dod policy that came out um you know so the guidance I would give or the opinion, right, the opinion, this isn't official, is to encourage that, go ahead and start encouraging that switch to full electrification. You don't get to make that decision yourself. That's going to be your stakeholders and your project management chain working with the correct stakeholders uh, that, that have the authorities to make this decision. Uh, but, you know, if they want to lean forward and go ahead and electrify, 
that's probably a wise idea. Um, if you're working on a uh, planning charrette, you're working on a, a, a DD-1391, um, it may be wise to go ahead and incorporate the worst case. Uh, I, I'd say go ahead and incorporate electrification. In this case, the DOD memo, memo is out. Sorry, remember this thing was developed before the policy came out. <laughs> I would go ahead and start uh, incorporating electrification, but do verify that with your PM, verify that with the programs folks at headquarters to make sure that's what we should be doing. Uh, then, um, same thing for code two efforts, just, you want to make sure that, uh, everybody's on board. If everybody's on board to lean forward and electrify, that's fine. Nothing says you can't electrify, um, you know, but, but I would go ahead and lean forward and, and uh, make sure you know what your plan is. And, and, and any day now an ECB is going to come out, I think, and the army policy and, and the project teams will have to pivot anyway. So it's, it's good to start planning now. <sighs> That all made a lot more sense about two weeks ago before we had a DOD policy. <laughs> uh, well, this is already o OBE also, right? Uh, new construction is probable that all new construction will have net zero or have zero scope one emissions. Well, that's that's come true. The DOD policy says zero scope one emissions for new construction. Uh, for retrofits, um, the thought was that the DOD agencies would need to identify which buildings they were going to electrify, given that it only really fully applies to ESA covered facilities, uh, but it looks like the DOD has taken a step further and said all facilities um, are applicable. And so anytime we do a major renovation or, or replace that equipment, then, then that equipment would be electrified. So they've, they've kind of taken it one step further than the federal standard. Uh, we're, they're probably going to uh, need to develop strategic plans uh, to show how they're going to meet those goals. Again, that's a pretty hefty goal to uh, electrify, um, you know, a huge number of buildings uh, by 2030 per the federal building performance standard. So my guess is they'd have a strategic plan and start working towards how they're going to um, uh, get funding and prioritize um, all these retrofits they would have to do. They also have to start considering their electrical uh, capacity at these installations um, and uh, what they're going to do when they're when they're running short on capacity. This could be a very large workload and the core will probably be in the middle of working on projects to support this. So just just uh, again, this doesn't replace any other requirement. This there's still the uh, guiding principle requirements for federal buildings. So we have to comply with UFC 12002 and any army or service specific policies. LEED is still required for army and we still have third party green certification for other uh, services and agencies. Um, they are recommending deep energy retrofits. So that might be other guidance that's coming is, is to when we have major renovations to start applying deep energy retrofits to buildings. <clears throat> Some special cases, there may be, uh, so we have a lot of bases that do have district energy systems. So that would be things like uh, centralized steam systems that will generate steam in one facility and then send that to several other buildings or chilled water uh, doing the same thing or the same thing with hot water. And if those are using fossil fuels, uh, eventually those need to be phased out. Um, and this this slide is related to building performance standard and how you count these buildings in that 30%, but nothing counts toward that 30% uh, re electrification requirement until the uh, one, like the full building has been electrified. So if you have a building that's still using, you know, a, a district plant that's, that's using fossil fuels, that building has to be electrified. Um, it'd probably be pulled off the plant and electrified to be, count towards that 30%. And the same thing with that district energy plant. If they change that district energy plant and they still operate it for some reason using electrical systems instead of gas systems, not sure why they would do that. They may. Um, then all the buildings that are served by that would would then, uh, assuming that they have no other fossil fuel use, they would count towards that 30%. So that's how they're handling district energy systems. And I won't talk about the campus stuff at the moment. So the approach to me is similar to, you know, there are challenges with the uh, electrification itself, but the process is, as far as how do we deal with uh, reducing our loads and energy efficiency and meeting all these requirements and electrifying, it's the same process we've had generally. So we, we try to reduce loads, we reduce lighting loads, we reduce 
uh, envelope loads. We optimize our massing and orientation to the extent the site constraints will let us and, and just, you know, reduce those loads. Um, we may look for heat recovery solutions and things like that to reduce loads. Uh, then we look at our equipment and, and achieving high energy efficiency. All the, all the ways we do that, the, the systems would be all electric uh, systems. And then uh, with anything left, we, we may end up applying renewable energy if life cycle cost effective or if we need to do it for resilience, uh, we may apply renewable energy. And at some point we may get guidance that says, hey, we need to put renewable, some amount of renewable energy in regardless. That has not been received yet. Just just that could be another step at some point. So to me, the process doesn't change. Um, when you're looking at, hey, I got to optimize these things. I got to compare the energy performance and the life cycle cost to an ASHRAE 90.1 baseline. Right now, that baseline would be the base the baseline that ASHRAE 90.1 dictates, uh, regardless of whether that's fossil fuel or electric. So the baseline would stay the same, but all your alternatives for energy optimization would have to be electric uh, alternatives. So some of the challenges we have with electrification uh, are listed here. We have uh, utility costs, so I would expect utility costs to go up, obviously. Um, just if you look at median prices across um, uh, the country, just basing, just looking at EIA.gov EIA and looking at different averages and medians, it looks like generally electricity is three times more than gas. That's just an average. Uh, up in uh, the Detroit area, uh, I was looking at a, a certain case, project case, and it would be electricity is five times as much, costs five times as much as natural gas. So it depends on what area of the country you're in, right? In some places, it's it's not that uh, hot, big a difference. In other places, it's very significant. So, But for, for this example here, it's about, it, on average, generally three times more than gas. Heating can make up 25 to 50% of the f facility's energy use, depending on the type of building and the climate. Um, and, and other factors. So, you know, it, it's a big chunk of the building's energy use and it's much more expensive uh, BTU to BTU, right? Um, there is a mitigating factor. Electric, even electric resistance is more efficient than natural gas heating. So it's it's five to 20% more efficient uh, than, than gas heating uh, per unit of energy use. And uh, heat pumps are two to three times more efficient than natural gas. Um, so much higher efficiency. So if you kind of look at rough math on uh, utility costs, if, if your electricity is three times more than gas, but you're three times more efficient in how you uh, use the energy, then uh, it could be a wash in some cases, right? So that's a little oversimplified. It doesn't apply in all cases. That's just uh, some quick math there. But in general, I expect the utility costs to go up. Retrofits, other, other things we have that are challenges, we may have um, problems with the electrical service capacity at a specific building, so we need to do a retrofit. Uh, that service was made for for uh, a building, and maybe it had has always used gas heating, uh, and now all of a sudden we got to up, upgrade the electrical service for that building. So any new retrofit in that building has to now account for that. Whereas in the past we might have just uh, replaced gas heating equipment with gas heating equipment. Now we have to worry about this. It may be more efficient gas heating equipment, but now we have to upgrade the electrical capacity to a, a facility, which could get uh, pretty expensive uh, because we're not even, we're, we're talking about interior panels, talking about circuits like that. We're talking about uh, potentially adding more transformers and feeders and all that sort of stuff. And then the installation itself may have an issue. If the installation's already got electrical capacity issues, this certainly isn't going to help uh, at all. And now we have to look at uh, the installation itself has to look at, hey, what kind of upgrades do they need to make? Uh, and they need to look at that strategically as they look at their building stock and how it's going to have to be retrofitted going forward and figure out what they're going to have to do with those installations. Uh, but but there could be major upgrade work required throughout the installation. They could require um, uh, service upgrade from uh, the privatized utility that's feeding them electricity, uh, you know, those kinds of things. If you're going to end up having... Um, power reliability issues now in a building and, and, and you got to be able to heat the building, uh, you may, we may need, more often need backup generators to account for that. So emergency backup generators are excluded from the fossil fuel requirement as long as they're for emergency use only. So think about that. But uh, there may be more energy or generator use. And you may have more of a case now to put renewable energy in, uh, 
applying renewable energy to a facility for resilience purposes because you're concerned about brownout or blackout or uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, space and infrastructure. So, uh, the one thing about, and I'll show you a couple cases, but uh, in certain climate zones, especially colder climate zones, um, equipment may not come in the same capacities uh, in, in electric versions as they would in gas versions. So now you may need more equipment, which may need uh, more space, more structural. It's definitely going to be more cost. Uh, you got to worry about accessibility. Uh, and especially where you've already got, um, you know, we have COS center standards, standardization standards, for example, where we have... Uh, quote unquote locked floor plans maybe, and we've got a certain amount of mechanical room space, for example, and if we're gonna exceed, um, uh, if we're gonna need more space than that provides, we have to think about those things now. Uh, so, uh, and, and by the way, I don't, I guess uh, I lump this together, the, the installation wide issues under retrofits, you could have the same thing with a new Milcon project uh, also. And I think one of those pilot projects, they're, they're kind of concerned about that also, so. So here's a couple of cases. Uh, you know, I looked at uh, a reserve center's, uh, what they call it, um, area maintenance support activity facility, uh, but it's a TIMF. It's a, it's a vehicle maintenance facility um, up near Detroit, it's actually a little north of there, but it's a $14 million project. The, annual, the estimated annual energy cost was $32,000 per year based on energy modeling and, and the utility rates. Uh, there's some information about the makeup air flows and all that. And then the, you know, Detroit's cold. It's, a, it's, it's 99% degree day, uh, 99% day is 9.6 Fahrenheit. So it's, it gets pretty darn cold there. Not zero or below zero, but it's still pretty cold. And so in, in the original, uh, project, we used gas fire makeup air units. Um, and it's way past 15%, so it's going to keep these makeup air units, these gas-fired ones, but uh, they may have been 500 MBH each, right? And then and then we got a certain duct size there. So we had two of these makeup air units. So as we move to electrification, we've got a couple choices. We can go to electric resistance heat with the, with the makeup air units, or we can go to a heat pump version of makeup air unit. And obviously, the heat pump version is much more efficient. Uh, but we cannot get the capacities we need uh, to keep two units. So now we have to go to three units. Now we have more equipment. We have more duct work. We also have to worry about structural support. There's actually a crane in this facility. So now we have to worry about the crane travel and make sure that we're deconflicting the equipment from uh, that train, that the travel of the crane. Uh, and there's other, you know, rippling effects as, as the, you know, all the designers know, it, there's ripple effects to all of this also. There's more circuits now, there's more, there's all that stuff. Um, and this is, this is an open bay. It's not even a mechanical room space. So we're not even talking about space constraints so much. But if you look at the electric resistance makeup air units, um, the equipment itself doesn't cost more one to one, but we can't find equipment in the right sizes. So we have more equipment. And so we end up paying a lot more um, for, for three units here. So we, this ends up being about 40% uh, more cost for, to go to electric uh, makeup air units uh, um, in, this, uh, in that scenario. On the heat pump scenario, the heat pumps are much more, are more expensive than the gas, uh, their gas equivalents. And we got three of them because we don't have capacities uh, to, to go with two. And so that's a lot more significant difference. So about 70% more cost. Uh, about 35% more duct costs just because we're adding other duct, more duct runs. We, we're reducing the size of the ducts, but not a lot. You can see that we went from like 26 inches and 16 inches here for, for when we have three runs to 28 and 18. So it's not a huge, huge difference in, in size. Uh, so we do have a, a cost, duct cost difference in this example. In this case, we uh, would remove the gas service from the building. Uh, and I, I'm, I know, I'll show you in a minute, we're, we're ignoring a few other uses of gas. I'm just trying to rough this out. And then we have electrical service that we're adding. So we're increasing the electrical service capacity of this building. So that has a cost associated with it, probably in the order of $110,000 on the exterior side and then 50K on the interior side. Uh, so the differences between the two cases in first cost, um, the first cost actually, uh, goes down in aggregate uh, for the electric resistance case. Um, and it, it goes down by 30K. It only goes down by 4K in the heat pump because the equipment's so much more expensive. The, 
the reason we're getting such, you know, even though we increase the the heat um, equipment costs in this case, we, we've got a huge savings from just the uh, utility service run from the gas. Um, so it may not work out that way. You may have a site that's right near a gas uh, utility uh, so that you would have had a very inexpensive run there and it might have been not as nearly as much money and it. This could have gone the other way. It could have been a cost increase because of the equipment. Um, it just happened in this case to be lower. Uh, in that area, gas, electric is five times the cost of gas uh, for the utility cost. Um, and so in the end, when you look at the efficiencies and, and all that, we, we end up using for the electric resistance case, 17,000 more per year, uh, which, which was a, um, let's see, we had 32K per year, right, for uh, annual energy cost right in the middle there. And now we're going up by 17. So we're uh, like 50% more electrical uh, or utility costs uh, on that for the heating by itself. Uh, there's more load there to consider. On the heat pump side, those are way more efficient. So even though we don't save nearly as much money on the first cost, or if, if this flipped the other way, uh, we would be spending more money on uh, first cost than on the electric resistance. We would have a lot uh, less lower energy cost use uh, in this case, there's a $30,000 per year increase. So it's still an increase, but it's a lot lower increase. Um, and then just so you know, there's other equipment in this building that use gas. There's a very small air handler for some small administrative spaces, like like a, a few people in a uh, office and uh, a break room, I think. Uh, there's a boiler for inflow radiant system and water heaters and the equivalent electrical capacity is shown there. But the entire electrical load for the building actually goes up by 40% for that whole building if we convert it totally to electric, which is a huge, which is a huge increase. So. So takeaways from this specific uh, case, uh, the number of equipment is going to increase, the distribution system uh, is going to increase, the costs are going to increase, but those are in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of dollars. And the uh, PA was 14 million. So we're looking at anywhere from a quarter to half a uh, percent of uh, cost increase uh, for the project. Uh, the utility service differences, it says in the 10, I know you're, it's, you're going to tell me it's 100,000, but I, I accounted for this 40% increase in electrical load and lost the math along the way. But um, in the end, it's it's only a, uh, a 10K, uh, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars difference. And it's also about half a percent uh, increase for this specific project. Uh, and again, that's going to depend on your service connection fees, length and size of service, local costs and all that. There's no uh, this is just a particular case uh, for renovation projects. Those differences are more significant, right? We don't get any kind of savings from not running gas. The gas is already there and we're not taking advantage of it. So we're adding electrical uh, 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 system costs, but but we're not saving anything on gas. So there's no trade off. Uh, there's more in interior infrastructure replacement, right? So if we had to, if you think about this equipment that we're uh, putting in, if we had to uh, an existing building and now had to uh, add more equipment to it. Now think about if there were structural impacts and those kinds of things that can ripple through all this. So uh, that could end up being even more costly. Uh, and we generally have lower project funding amounts for retrofits and, and renovations. Uh, so, you know, it's already a higher percentage relative to the uh, amount of funding you have. Uh, so anyway, but but another thing to think about, the direct one-to-one -one change from electric resistance, uh, you know, comes with a, a major ut yearly utility cost increase. So it's, it's in this case, it was about a 50% increase versus switching to heat pumps. And that, that might only see a 10% increase in your yearly utility cost. So things to think about. Another case, this is one that um, a couple of our mechanical cop members brought up. It was... Um, Dan Edwards and Sven Lee brought up about heat pumps, uh, water heating, heat water heating heat pumps. In this case, we're looking at a domestic water heating for something like a barracks, which has a huge hot water load, but it's 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 a peak, right? At, at some part of the day, usually in the morning, sometime, um, and and then you might have low usage the rest of the day, if any. Uh, but a lot of heat pumps uh, do not deliver the so so we require 140 storage at 140 degrees to kill Legionella in our hot water systems uh, by criteria, and as one uh, you know Sven had pointed out, uh, that's to kill that uh, 
in two minutes to kill the uh, Legionella in two minutes. You can store it at a lower temperature and kill it within two hours. So as long as you kept the temperature up, uh, the Legionella would not be an issue. But right now our criteria says 140. And so he pumps that deliver at 140. There's not many models of that. It may take um, uh, specialized units. They don't have the capacities we need. So if you try to do that, with heat pumps, you can end up with a huge bank of uh, a huge number of these heat pumps and run out of space to put those pretty quickly. Um, there are units that can generate uh, uh, 120 or 122 at um, uh, with higher capacity so that we don't have that space issue. So this is a case where we have criteria that's kind of conflicting with electrification and we might need to look at updating that criteria. And in the meantime, you may need to request exceptions to the criteria as you're uh, working through the um, through these projects. So something else to think about here. Um, so again, the takeaway here is criteria may need to change in some cases in order for reasonable designs to progress. So I would say if you're at a point where you're about to do something really dumb because criteria said to do something uh, and you have to electrify that you go ahead and you contact your <laughs> your cop leads, you work through your project teams, and maybe maybe that's time to think about pursuing exceptions and get, get some opinions about that uh, rather than proceeding with something that's, that's uh, obviously not a great idea. Uh, and if you're going to have to do something dumb, then force then force uh, force higher powers to make you do something dumb <laughs> in writing. Uh, you know, we already talked about the space and infrastructure issues, so that can get super uh, challenging for existing buildings. Uh, in this particular case, you know, we talked about hot water heating. Uh, maybe just heat pumps by themselves isn't the answer. Maybe what we need to do is look at heat pumps. For you know, maybe we have a large storage uh, tank. We keep it at 120. We use some heat pumps to keep it at uh, 120 during normal times. And when we hit a peak time, maybe we have to switch to um, electric resistance for some amount of time and in order to save space within a mechanical room. So just something to think about. It's not always one or the other. Sometimes it's a mix of things. So, And then another challenge we have is every stakeholder, all stakeholders have their preferred systems, the systems they're used to working on. And, and a lot of times those are gas fired systems. So I know Stakeholders from I used to I came from Louisville District and a lot of our stakeholders just love VAV air handling units with uh, gas fired boilers and, and uh, air cooled chillers. And so um, they are not going to love uh, uh, switching to heat pump systems. In fact, they've pushed back against us a lot of times when we off uh, point out that we should put heat pump systems into projects. Uh, but if if they stick with electric resistance, we're gonna we're gonna have issues with um, utility costs and uh, electrical capacity issues also. So um, this may be a time to go ahead and start leaning forward, start talking to stakeholders at installations about okay, here's this policy. Are you guys gonna pivot? Like, what are your new favorite systems? Are you gonna be okay with heat pumps? Uh, or are we going to have to put electric resistance in? And if we have to put electric resistance in, um, are you prepared to deal with that capacity hit? Uh, but all right, so all that's one side of this, but don't forget, we already have uh, superseding laws, regulations, policy, and UFCs that tell us we have to optimize based on energy efficiency and we can look at life cycle costs. So at the end of that, and if we have to do an analysis and we find that we heat pump systems are the most efficient that are life cycle cost effective versus baseline, then it doesn't matter if the stakeholder likes them or not, we may have to put them in. And, and the only reason we would not is if uh, someone could prove that they were infeasible in a certain case. So this is a big challenge to deal with our stakeholder relationships and something to lean forward with and start talking to your, uh, your um, customers about. Here are some links uh, to the resources. This, this link, uh, that, that link at the above, you can find the executive order, the building performance standard. That building performance standard is good. I would give that a read. Uh, it, it also sh show, uh, goes to the guiding principles uh, document um, and other documents. Um, so with that, are there any questions? I have two in the chat that I wasn't able to answer in the chat. So I think we'll, we'll start with that. Um, one of the questions is, so if we have a new construction project that the base wants to tie to an existing central energy plant and the CEP is fossil fuel f fired, um, will that violate this policy? Uh, let's see. All right. 
can you say that one more or oh, uh, one more time? Sure. Um, if we have a if you if you have a building that's tied to an existing central energy plant and the CEP is fossil fuel fired, will that violate this policy? Um, it that would that building would not. So relative to the federal building standard, uh, that building would not count towards uh, the 30% that's being that's required to be electrified, meaning that the agency could not take credit for that, right? Because they did not change it to an ele all electric facility. As far as the DOD uh, policy, if you're going to do a, um, that's actually a good question. I might have it to is. actually pull up. The, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I, I know we can't do anything to extend the use of the uh, the uh, the plant, but let's. Uh, hey Brandon. Yeah. Hey Brandon. This is Dawn. Um, so, isn't scope one just um, worrying about what's inside the building changing um, to uh, electrifying systems inside the building and what it's powered from? is not part of scope one, right? So is that kind of the same situation where um, what she's talking about is it's being powered from a gas powered plant, but what what we're putting in the building, as long as it's electric, it meets scope one. Well, it's federally owned. So yeah, and I'm sorry if I got confusing about that. So if it's federally owned, it counts as scope one, right? So if we're burning the fossil fuel on federal property, it's it's our facility, it's scope one. So in this case, it's scope one because it's 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 on federal property, and our building is that's connected to it is using fossil fuels, you know. Also, right? Um, if it were a, a a plant that's off post, then yeah, it would be scope two. But it's a plant on post, I think, in this case. Yeah, uh, and defining on yeah. site might be difficult. Um, I, I'm glad you're showing the DoD guidance. It talks a little bit about central energy plants, but it doesn't exactly define which is an on-site production so yeah uh, let me uh there the building okay. performance standard yeah the building performance so i'd i'll have to think about that it takes wanna, me more I, than a minute <laughs> i want to i want to jump in here a little bit because this this part of the uh criteria that says we should electrify district plants <clears throat> that has puzzled me because i i have no idea how you do that because I assume what we're talking about here in district plants, we're not talking about chilled water plants. We're talking about heating plants. And if we're talking about heating plants with a central heat distribution system, these are definitely fossil fuel. We're talking about Scotch Marine boilers, or we're talking about field fabricated boilers. You cannot electrify those. There's just, it, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, you're basically looking at a machine that's got a, you know, like a flame that's that's generated 10, 15, maybe even 20 feet long inside of a convection part or a, even a radiating part of a boiler. You yep. can't electrify that. Yeah. So, so you're, what, you're right. So what they'd have yeah. to do is they may have to decommission that uh, plant at some point and on, on the way, on the path. So the DOD policy here says that that building could continue to use that district uh, plant as long as that district plant's viable, right? Um, but they can't do anything to extend the life of that plant. So at some point, they're going to have to program for that facility to be that building that's connected to it to be retrofitted and be electrified and stand alone if they're going to have to um, decommission that plant, as Finn's talking about, right? Because you can't extend the life of the plant you can't replace it you can't let necessarily electrify the plant easily so it's all got to be part of a installation strategic plan there um but yeah that was a good question and good points finn appreciate that yeah and and thank you and and you know what i would offer to the group here is there's we've been decommissioning central heating plants up here in the northwest in seattle district for years now and it's it's completely life cycle cost effective and and i think a, a, what we've realized is there's nothing less efficient than the central heating plants. So I would offer that there's nothing that the USACE could do that would cut energy use down more quickly than to decentralize any of these plants that we have. Uh, it would probably be the most, in my opinion, the most cost effective thing we could do. It's kind of a side issue, but it's like as we're chasing, you know, things down the rabbit hole, 
it's like why not get the best bang for the buck and i believe that would probably be our best expenditure of funds moving forward over yeah yeah good points and 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 the, to answer that question i think i answered it a second ago the the there is it does not violate the policy to leave it connected to the plant the problem is that that plant eventually may go offline and so uh they need to plan for that okay one of the other discussion points uh one of the other comments i'm going to pull up i was kind of further up in there um the dod policy indicates that the assistant secretaries of iene of the military departments are supposed to develop the waiver exception process is that correct Yes, it's in the policy. And if so, when will that process be established? Um, the Army policy is not out yet. That should follow the DOD policy. Um, so we're waiting for that waiver process. Now, that being said, you'll probably need to contact um, uh, myself or Brandon or even Don Carney um, for discussions on individual projects. I think we're going to need to need to focus on you may have a central energy plant, and once you receive that project and you identify that there may be an issue, start that conversation. Start that discussion on whether you need a need an exception written, a waiver, even though there's not a waiver policy yet. Um, start that discussion so that we can help support you and hopefully get you the right answers. Yeah, and I, I, let me let me follow that up with if. You know, most of those projects, I mean, we could get some projects through um, some funding chain that comes down through the core. Right. And we get and we get the normal codes for. But most of the, you know, uh, rest, I, I assume I think this is true. The, the, the modernization and restoration projects are coming through uh, just directly from the bases to the districts. Right. And so there's an onus on the district on the uh, installation to, to plan this out and figure this out. So we may start asking the questions of headquarters and we but we definitely need to talk to our stakeholders about it. And, and if, you know, in my opinion, this is just Brandon's opinion, but that 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 garrison then has the, the major, uh, 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 I guess, uh, should have the major push to uh, go after an exception if one is needed. That shouldn't necessarily fall completely on the, uh, the the PDT. We might do a justification and help them with that, but in in the end, it's not us saying, "Hey, this we can't do this." This is going to be the garrison saying, "Hey, we can't do this." So, yeah, and and we'll see more of that when the waiver process comes out. And typically, that's how our waiver process is. <laughs> excuse me for lead silver, but I, I assume it will be something similar. Um, that it does have to go through the installation. The installations, the DPWs, and the ASA will be working towards this along with USAs. We should not be doing this by ourselves, and I don't, I don't assume that we will be. I don't know about this question, Brandon. You might know. Is, use, is using hydrogen gas considered to be not fossil fuel? I don't, does it produce CO2? No, sir, it does not. So I guess in those unique circumstances, it would not have a global warming potential and it would not be um, considered that uh, fossil fuel or or carbon producing. Yeah, but what about the what about the production of hydrogen? It's in, it's energy intensive. The, the production of hydrogen is very energy intensive. So that's exactly. what brings up the whole point about when you've got some, when you've got an energy source that's available at a certain so, at a certain time that you can use to generate the hydrogen, then that's probably useful. But yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to go back to if you have, if you have a hydrogen producing plant that you are constructing as a USACE designer, please call headquarters. First, we would like to know about it, and then we would like to do it. Otherwise, this wouldn't be scope one emissions in my in my understanding. But we may need to look into that. But but as as these projects arise with these unique circumstances, definitely bring us into this because there are questions that we can't answer currently on these unique cases, and that's why I think we'll gain a lot of information in the first year of implementing this policy. Okay, um, we'll hit a few more questions and then we're running out of time. We've only got about five more minutes. Um, but um, will 
The next question is, will there be EUI reduction goals set for new construction and existing building major renovations? Currently, DOD policy does not include that. And the, and the other portion of this is the idea that the grid will eventually be 100% green is almost counterproductive to incentivizing buildings to have a lower EUI. While that may be true, there's multiple facets to the executive order. And as we get additional policies or DOD policies that come out, um, we will look at if, if we're given the proper guidance and if we need to add more information to those. But currently, we only have the DOD electrification policy. And the ECB that you'll see um, in the future will only cover what we currently have, not all the other facets of the executive order that may or may not come through DOD policies and Army policies. Yeah, and to, to reiterate, um, we, we do at least have to achieve the highest efficiency that's life cycle cost effective. And so, um, you know, maybe at some point they drive us beyond what's life cycle cost effective, but we do have some requirements to that, uh, lowering EUI to that extent anyway. Okay. And I would think, you know, your energy use reduction would be beneficial even if you do go a 100% green grid so that you, I guess, would translate to a lower demand on that grid, which is going to be relying on, you know, wind and sun and whatnot. Over. Um, so uh, here's another question that kind of relates to the discussion. So. It says, early in the presentation, you showed where we would be planning to some extent of future use of new construction and remodel repair. How viable is this with materials like CLT mass timber? Um, it seems like there, we're, we're going to be doing a lot of research. We have a pilot project on mass timber um, that, we are, that we will be executing. So we will probably have more data on how viable that is. And that deals with more along the lines of the scope three emissions or our building material emissions. So as we gather more information on the pilot projects, um, we'll try to share that with you also. Is that mass timber project you're talking about, the um, FY25 UEPH at uh, JBLM? I believe it is, yes. All right, so that covers most of the questions. Um, if there's no additional questions, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank Brandon. Thank you for putting together this presentation and discussing this. Um, having the mechanical perspective, I think, is extremely important to this. And having that that the background that you have with, with mechanical engineering, with leadership, and being a certified energy manager, um, thank you so much for, for putting this on and um, discussing this with us. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I appreciate Sven and uh, Dan jumping in and answering questions also. <laughs> thanks. We Brandon. don't have all the thanks. answers yet, but we're working on them and we want to try yeah. to keep these discussions going. So thank you. Thank you. Thank the audience, too. All right. Next week, we're going to be discussing um, ASHRAE 90.1 and we'll start um, at the same time on Wednesday. Thank you all very much. And if you have any questions or you can't access the, the um, slides and you would like to, please send me an email and I'll try to try to fix that for you. Thank you.